How do you write a memoir by President Trump when you are not President Trump? Kurt Anderson joins us to talk about his faux memoir, You Can't Spell America Without Me, co-written with Alec Baldwin. Who are some of the key code breakers of World War II? Liza Mundy will be here to talk about her book, Code Girls. Our children's books editor, Maria Russo, will talk about this fall's best book for kids and the winners of our 65th Best Illustrated Book Awards. Alexander Alter will give us an update from the literary world. Plus, we'll talk about what we and the wider world are reading. This is Inside the New York Times Book Review. I'm Pamela Paul. Kurt Anderson joins us now. He is the co-author of a book with Alec Baldwin that is ostensibly written by Donald J. Trump. I'm going to give the full title. It's called You Can't Spell America Without Me, The Really Tremendous Inside Story of My Fantastic First Year as President by Donald J. Trump, a so-called parody by Alec Baldwin and Kurt Anderson. All right, that is a mouthful, but I guess appropriately so. Kurt, thanks for being here. My pleasure. Okay, how did this project come about? This project came about early this year when the the notion had, in some fashion of doing a Trump book, had occurred to Alec Baldwin. And we are acquaintances, uh, friendly acquaintances were. Uh, now we're close, very, very close friends, of course. But he called me and said, do you think this is a good idea? And I said, what's the idea? He said, well, I don't know, what, what, some kind of book. I thought about it, and we talked about it, and decided it was a good idea done in the way that we did it. And so that's how this idea came about, a germ, and then we turned it into a seedling, and here we are. And then kind of a a mad rush, right? Because you... Oh, yes. It was a mad rush. It was indeed a mad rush, because also the idea was born as I was, as I was still finishing the cuts and final polishes of a whole other book that took many years to write. And then uh, the writing and photography and everything else for this book had to happen within a very few months in the spring and early summer. Right, because Fantasyland came out in September. So there's like a two-month window where you have two books come out. You're also the host of Studio 360 on public radio. Alec Baldwin also has a couple of projects that he does. So, like, what was the collaborative process like? The collaborative process was that we met a bunch of times and talked a lot. And I said, "Uh, I have this idea and this idea and here's my this narrative arc. I could do this and... Then I started writing and gave him the first half of the book, and he responded. And then it became, uh, as they say in improv comedy, a kind of yes and thing, where, he, you know, as you know, it's written in first person as, as Donald Trump. And so he, because he's, he's thought about Donald Trump a lot as well, would say, oh, and then he could say this also here. And oh, and down here on page 28, he could also do this riff. And as he said, he was incredibly gracious as a collaborator and said, of course, you, you're, you're the novelist, you're the writer, you use my stuff as you will. And so a lot of it was great, and I used it and incorporated it. And so that was that. I was happy, and he was happy, and then went on. And So it was just, it was a normal collaboration, but a great one, because he let me do the heavy lifting that I right. wanted to do. And it was, <laughs> That's it was, a very it was kind great. way of putting it, let you do the, the heavy lifting. Because you jokingly said at the beginning that you were sort of the words and he was going to be the pictures. And I don't think there's any pictures of you in the book. Actually, there are. Oh, there They're, are. Not, not intentionally, but as we were on these sets of these fake Oval Offices and fake Mar-a-Lagos and White Houses wanting to do pictures, and we had the ideas for the pictures going into these two days of shooting, but we suddenly, the photographer and the creative director decided, oh, we need some aides around, and and so suddenly these photographer's assistants were enlisted. Oh, right. To be the there aides. you are. <laughs> but, then, but then we needed somebody who wasn't, you know, 29 right. uh, as well. So there I am playing some, I don't know, what? Steve Bannon, unfortunately. Yeah, I don't you, know who I'm playing. But. There is actually a passing resemblance, I, I have to say. I Kurt. hate to say that. Yes, it's the hair. It's the hair. It's mostly the hair. <laughs> so you have a history with Trump. The episode that stands out in my mind is the Czech episode, but I'd love you to tell us that story and just talk about your Trump related writing experience going back to your spy days. Yeah, we, we started Spy Magazine, Graydon Carter and I, uh, and our other partners in 1986. And in our very first issue of Spy, the cover story was called Jerks, the 10 Most Embarrassing New Yorkers. And one of those 10 embarrassing New Yorkers was the young and not very well known 40 year old Donald Trump who in that very first issue, to explain why he was included, we, we quote him talking about how he could do 
uh, nuclear missile negotiations with the Russians, with the Soviets then, so much better than anybody's uh, doing now because he, he knew everything he needed to know about missiles and he could learn what he didn't know in an hour. So that was our first look at Donald Trump. And because he was so responsive and, and rose to the bait and was just an extraordinary character, uh, we, we covered him a great deal in spy, both journalistically and, and just uh, juvenile name calling, short fingered Bulgarian, and so forth. And so that was that. And then he went on to go bankrupt and become a reality television star. And I went on to other magazines and write novels. And I had a 15 or 20 year <laughs> interregnum where I spent almost no time thinking about or writing about Donald Trump until, until he was running for president. And I was in the middle of writing this other book that was also Fantasyland, which was not about Donald Trump. But then he, it, he, he kind of barged into it and became a poster boy in its final chapters. Being a student of Donald Trump back in the 80s and 90s became a, a, a commodity, again, that people were interested in here in the last couple of years. And it has ended up in you can't spell America without me. So you made Donald Trump, essentially, um, uh, or... Please. <laughs> um, I, I, no, I, I tried to kill baby Hitler. That's, or, that's my version of it. Or at least you're, you're a, an established authority on Donald Trump. Uh, that I am. That I am. But the check episode, would you mind just telling listeners about that? Yes. We decided when we were doing Spy, we did prank occasionally. And so we had this idea of sending a whole dozens of well-to-do, well-known people, a small check for a dollar and 11 cents, about 60 of them. And, from, and we made up a company called the National Refund Clearinghouse and, and sent them a letter saying, oh, there's been a computer error and you're due a dollar and 11 cents and we apologize. And we wanted to see who would cash. Them. And so about half of the 60 cashed those checks. And we said, okay, we'll do it. We'll try it again. We'll send another check to the people who cashed it for 64 cents. With a, oh, we're sorry about this second computer error that you're due, you under reimbursed you, you're due 64 cents more. And saw that a dozen people cashed those checks. And so we, we did yet again, sent a check, uh, a new check. Oh, we're so sorry. Here's 13 cents that you're due. We, we under reimbursed you. Two people cashed those checks, one of whom was the Saudi arms dealer Adnan Khashoggi, and the other one was the then teetering on bankruptcy Donald Trump. And the day that happened, we all felt like there is a God, and, 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 <laughs> and we scored, and, and it was, no, it was extraordinary, and we, we didn't even intend it to be a Donald Trump story, but he, in his way, made it one. Well, Donald Trump, being now the president, continues to be Donald Trump, continues to do things, continues to do things that presumably are fodder for satire. So given the fact that you had this short window, did you find yourself constantly saying, well, we've got to add that, we've got to put this in, we've got to update it? Actually, what happened much more, but illuminating the same phenomenon, is I would create a fictional thing and suddenly it would come true. The chapter in which he muses early on about firing Comey was well before he fired James Comey, for instance. And then smaller things. I, I had a, this whole fictional episode that I thought about taking out after it became true, where, where he, he, he wants to fire somebody. He, he hates that the people working in the White House don't actually work for him. They're civil servants, and he can't fire them. And then I have Reince Priebus say, no, but this head steward, this woman, you could fire her. She's actually at will. And they do just to make him happy, fire this woman. And then weeks after that, this woman is fired. So that happened again and again of cases where, where these, these seemingly uh, impossible, but also vaguely plausible fictions came true. And then we had to decide, oh, are we going to keep that? Or or will it just look like we're reporting what happened? So that was more the problem than, than uh, oh, let's add this. Certainly, there were things that happened in the summer that we stuck in there as, as bits of this, this memoir, just to keep it as current as possible, and also made some large narrative choices about how it would end this book that I don't want to give away and spoil, but would account for and accommodate practically whatever happened in between the final lockdown of the book at the end of August and today. So you're either the master puppeteer or <laughs> you were secretly writing realistic fiction as opposed to satire. What was it like for you to channel Donald Trump? What was the experience to say, OK, now I'm going to adopt yeah. this language and this way of thinking and, and write in this voice? Well, you should talk to my wife who said I became a much more unpleasant person for several months. Sincerely, she thought that. And, and I, I said, 
more unkind things about people and was shorter with her than I was ordinarily. So that, but it was interesting. And I had never had to write something as substantial as this in such a short period of time. So that was just a, an interesting new literary, writerly, professional experience. That, I think, did actually have the benefit of really making me like a fictional, he's not a fictional character, but as if he's a fictional character, and of course, for this purpose he is, inhabit him fully. And I can't say that I became more sympathetic to what I imagine his inner psychological state is, but but I do feel I came out of that understanding it more viscerally, understanding the insecurity and the iffiness of his connection to reality better and more deeply than I did before I began. Well, it's interesting because it's like it's like foreign language. They say when you speak a foreign language, you begin to think differently because of the way in which that language is structured. And because not only is Trump's way of thinking so very particular, but also the language he uses yes. is highly yes. specific. And I, I would imagine it's it's kind of catchy. Like, did you find it in, infecting your your way of thinking and writing? <laughs> I hope not. But but it's but it's so true what you say about the language, and it is why, or it's connected to the fact that before I began and and reimmerse myself in all these unedited, raw transcripts of interviews with the New York Times and other papers and places, which were so useful in in kind of learning to speak the language, you know, and become fluent in the language. And I even created a, a lexicon for myself of, oh, here's the, here's the adverbs he uses, here's mm-hmm. the negative adverbs, here's the positive adverbs, here's the adjectives, here's, the, here's, here's how he zigzags off away from what he's been asked about, as though it was a, a primer in this strange language. But I don't think, I, <laughs> I don't think it, you know, affected <laughs> the way I think or write, but time will tell. Although, like an interesting writerly exercise to, to presumably edit your own voice out of your own writing. Uh, exactly right. And often I would write something and think, nah, that's too coherent. <laughs> that, that Exactly. I mean, Too it, logically it, consistent. Exactly. All those things. And so you, you had to let it flow, which was, you know, a kind of giddy writerly experience of being bad in exactly the right way to to do this particular thing. Not to get too meta, but you're also, in a way, channeling Alec Baldwin, channeling Donald Trump, right? Because his performance true. preceded this book. It's true. And one sees what he does on Saturday Night Live, uh, you know, in, in sketches written by talented uh, comedy writers. But what was really interesting is in our collaborative work together, he would, as he was like riffing and saying, oh, but he could, then he could say this. He would naturally fall into that voice in a, in a more naturalistic version of that voice, like the one he does in the audiobook version of the book. And that was both fun and hilarious and helpful to me, as you say, to sort of create that hybrid of Alec doing Trump with what I imagine Trump thinks like and talks like and, and what we see him doing. And, and then, uh, even more amazingly and entertainingly, the, these, the two days we spent doing all these pictures, he almost nonstop, be, partly because he was in the whole drag and the fat suit and the hair and the, all everything, he, he was Donald Trump in an almost Daniel day lewis way for the, those, those days, and uh, very hilariously so. You're on the record as as not being a particular fan of Trump or his policies. Was it a challenge for you to maintain your sense of humor around Trump? Well, you know, it, it is. I mean, that's an interesting question for all of us who are, you know, spending time satirizing, parodying, whatever Trump, when we also are worried that, that he's a dangerous person and, and it, this could all become catastrophic more than it is already. But on the other hand, I'm a professional. I can maintain my sense of humor. And where this book ends is pretty dark and weird and not just, oh, look, he's orange. He's got funny hair. So I'm happy as a writer slash citizen that it goes where it goes in its sense of humor about this creature. What was the easiest thing for you to satirize? The well-known, it's fabulous, it's, it's all those things. So we know what he does, which is the hyperbole from a fairly small palette of, of superlatives. So the challenge was to, to, as I build this lexicon, to go a little deeper and say, oh, 
here are the other words he uses other than huge. I don't think I don't think the word huge is in the book because that's the one that became the cliche. So, right, right. So well, I, I guess I meant like it's almost too easy to satirize some things. Exactly. And so the the trick is to try to remain surprising and go places that he hasn't gone, but that one wouldn't be surprised if tomorrow he did. Do you know, because it was first person in this familiar first person voice, there's a lot of actual material that then one can extrude and reproduce and extrapolate from. Again, I don't want to ever say writing is easy because it isn't ever easy for me anyway. And I, I never say, oh, that was fun. This, I got to say, partly because it was a, this, this circumscribed period of time. I, I didn't have to invent the character from scratch as right. one does when one is writing fiction. It was more fun than writing usually is, I have to say. And in a certain sense, easier than for me than writing usually is because of the the constraint. Okay, it's Donald Trump. It's his election in the first eight months in office. When you're when you're writing a book, when you're thinking up a book, you you rarely I rarely have it so clearly worked out ahead of time, and the character is so flesh ahead of time. So so in a sense, I don't want to understate uh, the, my accomplishment, but it was it was easier <laughs> easier than than much writing I have done. You're doing that opening the door for a sequel thing here. I am? Oh, good. I, <laughs> I didn't even realize that's what I was doing. Good. I want to ask you to read from it, but then there's the challenge then of, of you having to, I don't know, possibly imitate Alec Baldwin imitating. Which I, which I would never do except, you know, privately. And what I would suggest, actually, is that you perhaps use a bit of the audiobook instead of me doing it. All right. Here is a clip from the audio so that we don't have to hear Kurt Anderson channeling Alec Baldwin channeling Donald Trump. The chapter you just read was written personally by me, Donald Trump. I swear it, on the life of my youngest daughter. What you're reading now, I am also personally writing. This entire book, me, all the words and sentences, and larger sections, the uh, paragraphs, the chapters, all mine. Not as told to or with some pathetic low-life parasite ghostwriter. This Trump book... Unlike my many previous excellent Trump books, which were typed up by subcontractors who interviewed me, is being created 100% by me. It will be, if I can be completely honest, the best one. It already is. One last question. Yep. If you could write the script for the scene or the chapter for the scene in which Trump, actual Donald J. Trump, receives Ooh. this book gets this book in his office, perhaps in the Oval Office. How does that play out? And he actually reads the book? Well, that would be an astonishing thing, wouldn't it? And I would have done something for my republic to have made this president read a book. Um, I, I guess what I would love to happen is that he would start reading it and think, well, this, this does sound like me. This, this is great. I, I've hired all these writers in the past to write my memoirs and, and books, but these guys do it better than has ever been done. That would be the scene. So this is secretly an audition to be Donald Trump's presidential memoir ghostwriter. Exactly. And, and then, of course, at the end of the scene, he would realize when, I don't know, Ivanka or somebody told him that, no, but daddy, it makes you look bad. Then he would send out a dozen tweets saying what horrible, disgusting people Alec and I are. And then my day would be perfect. Your work would be done. Exactly. All right. Well, since so much of the book apparently already has proven prophetic, perhaps it <laughs> will all come true. Kurt, thank you so much. Oh, it was my pleasure, Pamela. Thank you. Kurt Anderson is the co-author with Alec Baldwin of a parody book. It's called You Can't Spell America Without Me, The Really Tremendous Inside Story of My Fantastic First Year as President by Donald J. Trump. Liza Mundy joins us now, fittingly, from the Museum in Washington, D.C., to talk about her new book, Code Girls, the untold story of the American women codebreakers of World War II. Liza, thanks for being here. Thank you so much for having me. So you just did an event with the author of Hidden Figures. There's kind of a moment right now for these books, it seems, about women, you know, having done great things in the past and curiously overlooked for having doing it. Absolutely. Margot Lee Shetterly made the point at our panel that it's as though somebody flipped on the light and there were all these rooms full of women there who had been there all along. I thought that was a great metaphor. What brought you to this story? How did, how did the light switch on for you? 
my, my husband was reading a declassified NSA history about one of the smaller code-breaking projects during the war, and it mentioned that 90% of them were women. And I just thought that was extraordinary. And I went out and spoke to the historian at the NSA, the National Security Agency, and the curator of the National Cryptologic Museum, which is our version of Bletchley Park. They were both women, and they laid out this much larger story of thousands of women being recruited to come break German and Japanese and other codes during the war. So, you know, as they were sitting there laying it out, I, I again, I, I couldn't believe that it hadn't been told. Okay, I have to go back and just break apart that sentence a little bit, because you said very casually that your husband was reading this recently declassified document as if he were reading the latest issue of Sports <laughs> Illustrated. Why was he reading this? Well, I'm lucky to be married to somebody who reads declassified documents for fun and pleasure on weekends. He's he's always been interested in the Cold War period, and this particular document had to do with our project to break the Soviet code systems during the war, which we weren't supposed to be doing. They were our ally, and the project was called Venona. It was top, top secret, and it was mostly women who were doing it, and most of them were school teachers. And then that particular project continued during the Cold War for many years, actually, and it continued to be mostly women who were working that project. So so that's what he was reading. So it started off not with the school teachers recruited by the Army, but with the Navy in 1941. Is that correct? Right. And that's what I learned once I, once I started diving into the research, that immediately after, and even a little bit before the surprise attack on Pearl Harbor, the Navy realized that it needed just infinite more code breakers, communications intelligence officers. And I actually found a document at the National Archives. It was produ- The Navy was producing weekly memos about where it was getting its cryptanalysts, where it was looking to find people who could do it. And there was a memo that said, new source, women's colleges. So somebody in the Navy had the bright idea to start approaching the women's colleges. Why did they go to women's colleges? They went to the Seven Sister Schools, right? Yes, the Navy had been historically, it would recruit its intelligence officers from the Ivy League. Mm -hmm. So when they, uh, and and obviously immediately after Pearl Harbor and we entered the war, the men started shipping out. I mean, suddenly men were unavailable. So the Navy thought, well, the next best thing, uh, we've been recruiting from the Ivy League, so we'll turn to their female counterparts. And so that's where women receive these secret letters, selected women from the senior classes at Wellesley and Smith and Bryn Mawr were secretly invited to these meetings where they would be asked, do you like crossword puzzles and are you engaged to be married? And and I should say that the deans and presidents of these women's colleges were very eager to serve the war effort. They were also very crafty and they realized that the war was an opportunity to give their female undergraduates more job opportunities. So they were also working closely with the Navy to identify and then train their most promising senior women. Who was behind this effort to recruit these women? Was there one person in the Navy who made this decision, who was the driving force? Not so much at the Navy. I mean, there had been a woman, an incredibly important woman civilian at the Navy all during the 1930s. She was a Texas school teacher. She was a genius in math and languages. Her name was Agnes Driscoll. And she had sat at a desk day after day in the 1930s diagnosing how the Japanese fleet code worked, the the main code system that the Navy used. It was what was called a super enciphered code. And she was basically doing decryption. And so the Navy did have a history of using some female civilians to do this work. Agnes Driscoll was legendary. The men who went out to the Pacific after Pearl Harbor uh, and became famous later, they were all trained by her. So there was a, a history of, of women doing this work, which sort of a little bit of it seemed secretarial, and it wasn't that important before World War II. Uh, people didn't believe that code breaking could be used in battle, mm-hmm. uh, that it could be done quickly enough. But during World War II with the Battle of Midway, which completely turned on American code breaking, and, and all the guys who did it had been trained by Agnes Driscoll, that's when it was suddenly put on the map, and they realized how important it was going to be. So, I'm sorry, this is a lengthy way of saying that there had been some women in the Navy operation back before it was truly prestigious. And so it didn't come as a complete 180-degree turnaround. So you mentioned that some work was secretarial or seemed secretarial in nature, but what was the work of these code breakers? It was not in the day-to-day all that interesting necessarily, right? 
Yeah, it varied. And once the women got recruited, I mean, there were 4,000 women doing it for the Navy. There were 7,000 women doing it for the Army. There were innumerable code and cipher systems being used, you know, during a global war where communications had to travel for thousands of miles. So the German U-boat commander was communicating with all his U-boats. The Japanese Army was communicating with their headquarters. And we were snatching all these signals out of the air. And different systems required different methods. But the one that I just talked about, the Japanese naval code, all the words would be rendered as five-digit code groups. So it might be like 6789. But then they would be enciphered and another uh, set of numbers would be added to them. And Mm -hmm. that's what would be radioed. So the people doing the work had to strip out that additive in order to get down to a code group that might announce say, the noon position that a ship was going to be at the next day. So they had to do it very quickly. So it was repetitive, but it was also stressful and urgent. And they all had brothers or fiancés or husbands who were in the war. So they felt enormous responsibility, and they were always told, you know, you cannot make a single mistake. So even if it was repetitive, it was, it was urgent and stressful. And the hours were long. The hours were long. They worked 24 hours a day, so they were on shifts. And ultimately, the Navy opened up, the Navy created the waves uh, and even enlisted women who hadn't gone to these, you know, elite colleges. If they had aptitude and intelligence, they could join, and they joined the military, and they were on what the, what the Navy called watches, which is what we would call shifts. So they might be working in the middle of the night. So. For people who are familiar with sort of the Bletchley Park version of this story over in the UK, what was different about America's decrypting sort of operation? We had a bigger operation, actually. It's not as well known as Bletchley Park, but I think because really there's not a sort of a, a place like Bletchley Park. Bletchley Park has sort of a glamour to it, and it's one location. We had the Army and the Navy doing this work in two separate locations. You know, anybody who lives in Washington like me is not surprised. And Bletchley Park had tennis courts. <laughs> yeah, tennis courts, yes, and the sort of the glamour of the debutantes. But we actually had a much bigger operation. We had more women, and we were working more code systems. The Bletchley Park was mostly concentrating on the German Enigma machine Mm -hmm. that was used by their Army, their Air Force, and their Navy, the the Germans. We were working a lot of different Japanese code systems. We were were also cooperating with the British on on the the German naval U-boat codes. In fact, we pretty much took over that operation, and it was it was pretty much exclusively being done by, by women by the end of the war. How successful were they? Well, we completely cleared the Atlantic of the of the U-boats. They were completely eliminated from the Atlantic Ocean so that the convoys could travel to England to bring our sailors and soldiers to make the D-Day landing. So, I mean, that was completely successful. We, uh, we broke the Japanese naval fleet code over and over. And also, the Battle of Midway is very famous, but one of the most important efforts during the war was the sinking of the supply ships that were supplying the Japanese army on all the islands they had captured in the land masses. And that was literally school teachers who had been recruited by the army, uh, civilian school teachers who traveled to Washington. Uh, I have a number of them in my book. They didn't know what work they would be doing. And they were put to work decrypting the enciphered system that the army used. And they sank supply ships. They sank thousands and thousands of supply of supply ships. And I, I even found a poem in the archives about school teachers sinking the shipping of Japan. And that doesn't get talked about as much because it took place over the course of months. But in the end, most Japanese army deaths were as a result of starvation or or, or disease. And that was because the supply ships had been sunk and they couldn't get food and they couldn't get medicine. So it it had an enormous impact on the the Japanese army and the course of the war in the Pacific. What was life like after the war for these women? I mean, did they just sort of pack up their papers and and go home to their former lives? Did any of them continue after the war was over in, in some capacity? Yes, but the women had been told during the course of the war that they would be shot if they talked about what they were doing. You know, you couldn't, it was treason to, to talk about a top secret project during the war. And so they, they told people that they were secretaries. And because they were women, people believed that the work they were doing couldn't be important. Then after the war, most of them went home. They were given a medal. If they were with the Navy operation, they were told never to show it to anybody. I had to persuade some of the women to even show it to me now. And they were told never to talk about what they did. And 
In fact, that, that oath of secrecy was lifted in the 80s and 90s when some of the men started talking and historians started writing about this, but nobody ever told the women. So they went through most of their lives never talking about it, and the majority took it to their graves. But there was a cohort of women who continued with the work after the war and rose to very high positions in what is now the NSA, the National Security Agency. So the first female deputy director of the NSA was a 22-year-old codebreaker during mm. the war. And those women tended to not get married and not have children, because if you were going to be in high-level government intelligence work after the war, you, if you, and you were a woman, you really had to just completely commit yourself to that work. So you mentioned that some of the women were kind of reluctant to talk about certain things. You interviewed more than 20 former codebreakers for the book. I did. I found them. And, and, you know, since the book has been published, I've heard from more. They tend to be online because they were code girls then and they tend to be code girls now. So, yes, I, I did track down 20. And in some cases, I had to convince them that they wouldn't be put in prison anymore if, wow. they, if they did talk about what they did. Yeah. And, and But at this point, I think most of them realize that books have come out on these efforts and that they were essentially n- neglected in the official history. And they were very understandably proud of their work and eager eager to get credit. And one of the women said to me during my reporting, you know, I, I just hope that I live long enough to, to see the book published. Wow. And she did. I would love to hear about one of your conversations. Tell us about one of the codebreakers you interviewed in person about their time and how you found them and what those conversations were like and what her story was. So a friend of mine went to visit her mother, Wellesley, class of 43, in an assisted living facility in Maine. And she came back and she said, okay, I've got three for you. So up there at that facility in Maine, there were three former code breakers who had been recruited from um, Wellesley and Smith. But one woman, Jane Case Tuttle, who had actually joined as an enlisted woman, she came from a very affluent uh, family. Her father was a physicist, Theodore Case. And she, she, when she enlisted in the Navy, she thought she would be made an officer because she had gone to music school, but they didn't consider that to the equivalent of college. So she uh, went in as an enlisted woman, and she had great stories about what it was like from her upper class background to go through the uh, enlistment process. She was nearsighted, and uh, she had memorized the eye chart so that she could make it through that part of it. But she wasn't prepared for the naked physical uh, when she had to actually take off her clothes because men in the Navy did, and um, so. Somebody, a woman actually drew the number, I think it was nine, between her breasts and said, okay, go stand between eight and ten. And so because she was so nearsighted and had had hidden her spectacles, she had to go around peering at other women's breasts in order to make it through the physical. But what was so wonderful was that simply because of her intelligence, she got routed to the code-breaking facility, uh, and she had some wonderful tales. She was tested one time when she was walking the streets of Washington. She was picked up in a car because during the war, uh, people were told to pick up members of the military and give them a ride. And this person in the car started saying, he was a man wearing a raincoat. His wife was there. He said, so what do you do in that big facility up there in uh, northwest Washington? What do, you all, what do you Navy women do there? And she said, oh, I, I fill inkwells and I sharpen pencils and I give people what they need. And he said, well, what is that Q patch that you all wear? stand for. And she didn't have a script for this. And she said, oh, well, it's uh, it's, it's Q for communications because the Navy can't spell. And when he let her out, he reached over and opened the door and she, the, hike, the sleeve of his raincoat hiked up and, uh, and she saw that he was a Navy admiral and he had been testing her ability to keep a secret. Wow. And she passed. But she also talked about realizing that she was, in fact, very, very good at math. She had grown up um, being sort of discouraged in that realm. And she had to do, she was working the Japanese Naval Fleet Code. She talked about the stacks of messages she would have every day, the volume of the Japanese Naval messages, and knowing when a fleet action was about to happen or something was about to happen in the Pacific because the stack would get even higher. So even though the women were landlocked in Washington, they were, they were tethered to the action in the Pacific. And, and, and a number of them knew what was happening to their brothers and, and their, their fiancés. Wow. Well, The Secret is out now. Liza, thank you so much for being here. Oh, thank you for having me. It's a great honor to, to be on your podcast. The book again is Code Girls, The Untold Story of the American Women Codebreakers of World War II by Liza Mundy.
Joining us now, Maria Russo, our children's books editor. Hi, Maria. Hi, Pamela. So this is a very exciting time of year always. It is our biggest children's book issue of the year, as well as the time when we unveil our Best Illustrated Awards this year in its 65th year, which is tremendously exciting. These are books that, of course, are about illustration, so you want to look at them. So I will give the URL. It is nytimes.com slash books so that you can go online and check out these glorious illustrations for yourself. But Maria, tell us a little bit about what makes this list exciting and special. Well, this is a great list this year. As always, it's really international. One thing about our award, which is different from other illustration and picture book awards, like the Caldecott, the Caldecott is only open to Americans, whereas we consider all picture books. So it's, as always, it's a very international list. There's Akiko Miyakoshi from Japan, The Way Home in the Night. There's winners from France. Remy Corjan has an adorable book called Feather. Of course, Beatrice Alemania on a magical do-nothing day. And uh, England, of course, Laura Carlin. There's an Australian winner, Mark Martin. So I really encourage people to go and take a look at these books on our website. And if you can get a look at the whole book, because we only give you one beautiful image, they're really worth looking at. And again, one thing about this list, too, is they tend to be more picture books that appeal to grown-ups and children. So by all means, show them to your kids, but you'll enjoy them too. They're just stunning artistic achievements. Another thing that differentiates the list from the Caldecott, for example, which is about sort of the book as a whole, is that this is an, an award really for the illustrations. Right. Our judges, we pick an independent panel of three judges. They don't look at how the story works, really. They're just looking at the achievement of the artist as an illustrator. And picture book illustration right now, many people are saying this, is at a is at a height. There's so much really great illustration happening in picture books, and this award really focuses on some of the the best practitioners right now. And this also, I think, brings home a point that I know, Maria, you feel as strongly as I do about, which is the importance of picture books, not just about getting kids excited about reading and about the text, but really about that kind of exposure to great art and It's visuals. true. Picture books are an art form in themselves. You know, the story is told through the pictures as much as through the words. And children, especially children who aren't reading yet or who are just starting to read really appreciate that and they know how to do that they know how to read through pictures because that's how they get through their days so we have in the rest of the issue too lots of other great picture books that aren't on this list this year but certainly could have been you know right. by some of the great this we have reviews and these of, are about the, the stories and the pictures right some of these these books like for example we have the boy and the whale by the great mordecai gerstein a book i love i just read it to my seven-year-old son last night and he was riveted and he's getting to the age where I can't get him to look at every single picture book I might like him to. He loved The Boy and the Whale and, you know, great illustration of a fast-paced story about a boy who rescues a whale. And Gerstein, of course, is uh, an award-winning illustrator and author who did a book that many listeners who read picture books would know of, which is The Man Who Walked Between the Towers. Yeah, he's just a wonderful picture book creator. There's also some very different types of picture books that we review in the issue. The Argentine comics artist Lanier's has a fantastic picture book. I love called, this book. I know. It's called Goodnight Planet. It's really fun. He works in a very cartoony style. So everything moves very fast. A lot of the action is told through panels. Right. But there's plenty of words for, for early readers about a, a, a stuffed rabbit that takes off in the night and has an adventure. But it's it's mischievous and funny and really cool. And this book is published by an imprint, Toon Books, which believes that children can begin reading with comic right, books. Right. More visual. They talk about visual readers, which is a which is a sort of a meme right now. And it's really true. A lot of kids not so confident reading words can read pictures and help them, that helps them get into more text-heavy books. It, and it keeps them excited about books, which is so important at that age. Another picture book that I especially love reading with my youngest child, because it has a lot of humor in it, is Dan Santat's After the Fall, How Humpty Dumpty Got Back Up Again. And it's like, just when you think that you've kind of had enough with the mother goose, that he some breathes, illustrator will come right, along and do something. new life into Humpty Dumpty. It's a fantastic book, After the Fall. I love that one. It's really a about failure and putting too much expectation on yourself and picking yourself back up after you fall off. And and it's it's funny and it's 
it's kind of inspirational too. the ending. There's a surprise ending that I did not see coming. I don't know if you saw it coming. We're and not going to give it away We're not going to give it away because it's really one of the greatest surprise endings in, in recent picture book history, I would say. That's another book I would really recommend to read to kids of, of any age. I think a, a three or four year old who's big into nursery rhymes would get it, would have fun with it. But also seven, eight year olds are going to get something out of that book. Here's another interesting book in this week's issue that I think people will not expect to see. As an author, Mark Twain has a book. Right. A new children's book. This is a manuscript discovered recently in in an archive of a story that Mark Twain told to his daughters at their bedtime and and then at one point just decided, I want to write that down. A scholar discovered it. It found its way eventually to the children's book author, illustrator, husband, wife team, Aaron and Philip Stead. And they really re-engineered it. It's called The Purloining of Prince Olio Margarine. And it's a it's a tale set in a sort of nameless, timeless kingdom. It could be 19th century America. It could be anywhere. And so Aaron Stead contributed these very dreamy, ethereal illustrations. And Philip Stead wrote alongside Mark Twain. So he interjects his own voice in to tell the story. And he creates a character of Mark Twain. So Mark Twain himself is telling the story along with Philip Stead. So it's a fun book that if you have Twain-loving parents, you can introduce your children to one of your favorite authors in a way that will work for everyone. All right. Let's talk about some books that kids might enjoy reading on their own. What is good in terms of great middle grade fiction? Well, as you know, I love middle grade fiction. And my, one of my favorites in this issue is called The Stars Beneath Our Feet by David Barkley Moore. It's about a boy who is a whiz at Lego, which is something, you know, I identify with. Both of uh, my sons are real Lego guys. And it's really an emotional book. This is a kid who's growing up in Harlem in the projects, has a lot of loss in his life. He's lost his brother. He's up against a lot of, you know, financial difficulty, but he kind of finds a way through Lego to connect again to the world. It's beautifully written and it really gets into the feeling of being a kid. There are just there's just great writing there that I think any kid will will really it will really hit home about what it feels like to not have what you want to not know where you're going. It's really beautiful. And there's another Harlem novel. On it's the true. List. There's two, two novels set in Harlem this year. The other one is called The Vanderbeekers of 141st Street. And that one is really old fashioned. Now, The Stars Beneath Our Feet feels very contemporary. And this one, The Vanderbeekers of 141st Street, is a throwback to those big family novels like All of a Kind Family or The Melendi. Five Story Mistake. Right. So these these this family lives in a brownstone, lots of kids. It's a multiracial family, a biracial family, which kind of updates it. But they're up against, you know, an old fashioned dilemma. They might have to move out of their beloved home and they have to win over the landlord. It's really fun. It's really heartwarming. And it has a holiday theme ending. If you're looking for a holiday, a good holiday book, uh, I really enjoyed it. And it made me feel made me feel good inside. Do you have any real favorite standout on the list in terms of middle grade fiction? I would say it's a tie between those two Harlem books, Stars Beneath Our Feet and Vanderbeekers of, of 141st Street, but also The Explorer by Catherine Rundell, if you want something a little more adventurous. It's four kids marooned in the Amazon after a plane crash. And our reviewer, Elliot Trever, points out, you don't see that much survivor fiction for kids anymore. So much of that has become nonfiction, right? The mm-hmm. I Survived series and stuff like that. But this is a good old-fashioned novel about four kids having to make their way out of the jungle on their own. And it's it's really fun. All right. What about YA, both for, for teenagers and for grownups? For teen, as we know, many YA readers are, in fact, grown-ups. So we separated our YA coverage into two, two categories. We have fantasy and realism, and some people like both. But the, uh, the realism we have, the one I really liked, uh, a National Book Award finalist called Far From the Tree by Robin Benway. Now, this is not to be confused with Andrew Solomon's yeah, adult it's one nonfiction of those titles, book. Right, one of those titles title. you hear a lot. But that is about a, a 16-year-old who's pregnant, who is giving her child up for adoption. And in the process, she was adopted and she reconnects with her own birth family. And it's just really beautifully written. And um, it sounds like a downer, but it's an incredibly good, uplifting book. Then there's one other National Book Award finalist in our coverage, I Am Not Your Perfect Mexican Daughter by Erica Sanchez. That I really liked, too. Really beautifully written 
And, you know, just the the classic conflict between my parents want me to be one way and I want to be another. And it's resolved by maybe finding out a little bit more about the struggles of her parents and really, really a fun, fast, emotional read. All right. I have a question, a technical question. The books that you have this week on the YA realism list are all marked ages 14 and up. And it it used to be that sort of YA was traditionally 12 and up. There were always books that were 14 and up, 15 and up. If there were issues of drugs or sex or perhaps violence involved, they got a higher age ranking. And I'm curious, why all the 14 and up? Are there issues in here that aren't suitable for slightly younger teens? That's a great question. I think all of these books will be read and and can be read by many 12-year-olds. I think the publishers are just getting a little bit more cautious because, as you say, YA is really really edgy now. There's, you know, there's Dear Martin, which is about police brutality, you know, about it's the Black Lives Matter movement. Basically, there's there's a little bit of drug use here and there in these. There's definitely sex. We have a pregnant 16 year old and we don't necessarily see the sex, but Release by Patrick Ness, which is on the fantasy in the fantasy roundup, it definitely has a, is, a, is about, you know, a gay boy trying to come into his maturity, and it definitely has a sexual scene in it. So I think, you know, there are 12-year-olds who are ready. There are 12-year-olds who are not ready for these books. And I think these categories of YA and middle grade are slightly shifting. There's a lot of older middle grade. The Explorer, for example, the Amazon survival story, I think would be perfectly exciting and fine for a 12-year-old. And a lot of these YA books now, they do have mature, quote-unquote, mature themes that you want to just be aware of before you give them to your 13-year-old. So pushing the envelope a little bit. Maria, thank you so much. Thank you. Alexander Alter joins us now with some good news from the publishing world. Yes, Hi, Alexander. this week I have... Hi, Pamela. I have good news all around, both from publishers' revenues, which are up in the first half of this year, and from the bookstore community. So we'll start with publishers. The latest report from the Association of American Publishers came out in late October, and it showed that in the first half of this year... Revenue was up by 3.5% for publishers. It was up to $5.72 billion. So that's compared to the first half of 2016, which is pretty good. I mean, a lot of people thought last year book sales were depressed by all the political news and the election was sucking all the oxygen out of the room. So we're seeing publishers kind of recover this year. And interestingly, you know, we can they always break it down by format, and that's fun to look at. Hardcover was up by almost 10%, Hmm. which, you know, is kind of amazing. Those are the most expensive kinds of books you can buy. And that, that I think, demonstrates just great new books coming out and people responding to those. to read them. Exactly. And Children's and YA was up by about 4.5%. Adult books were up by more than 3%. See, this is why Twitter had to increase to 280 (laughs) characters to compete with books. Long form, yes, exactly. Paperbacks were down, not by a tremendous amount, but by almost 2%. Mm -hmm. And e-books were down again by almost 5%. Meanwhile, the fastest growing format continues to be downloaded audio, which was up by 32%. Wow. Yes. So things are looking more than stable. I would say things are looking pretty good for publishers, at least in the first half of this year. And of course, you know, the fall is when the big books come out. Leading into the Christmas, you know, holidays, shopping season is when you're going to see the bookstores sort of really, that's when I think they make the most money of the entire year. So this is, we're entering a critical period right now. What to get for dad and for the grandchildren. Exactly. All right. And then some exciting book selling news too. Yes. So a few months ago, Publishers Weekly had a report and it was somewhat speculative or they were breaking the news that the Canadian bookstore chain Indigo Books was going to be expanding into the U.S. And those plans have been confirmed. Indigo said that they are planning to open a bookstore next year in New Jersey, and that will be a 30,000-square-foot space in the mall at Short Hills. And they expect to do three, four, or five stores then over the next year or two in the U.S., which is really interesting because, as you know, Barnes & Nobles has been struggling here. Amazon has been pushing into physical retail. But to have a new kind of competitor uh, that that's a chain, that's a successful chain, setting up in the United States market, it will be really interesting to see how they do here. What distinguishes Indigo stores from other chains? Do they do something different? You know, 
I don't know if it's what they do or if it's the Canadian book market and if that is different. It's just the Canadian thing. It's possible that Canadians have, you know, warmer feelings towards bookstore chains than Americans. But they've certainly been doing well. The revenue for the most recent quarter, which ended September 30th, was it was up 3.5% compared to a, a year ago. So I can see why, you know, perhaps they're spotting the weakness, you know, in the U.S. market and seeing a potential void that they could fill. So we'll see how that goes Always for good them. good to end on an up statistic. Thanks, Alexandra. <laughs> Thanks for having me. Joining us now, my colleagues at the Book Review, John Williams, Greg Coles, and Jen Salai. Hi, guys. Hi, Hi Pamela. Pamela. All right, so I've, I've already given a warning here that I very <laughs> pathetically am still reading the very short novella that I began last week. So I will talk about it at a very minimum at the end. Let's start with you, Greg, because you're also yeah, reading I a short novella. I am also book. reading a very short novella. I, I guess... Officially, this is probably a novel. It's about 160 pages, but there's a lot of white space. There is in that book. It reads like a novella. The book I'm reading is Another Brooklyn by Jacqueline Woodson, best known really as a children's book writer. And she really got her start as a poet and then a children's book writer. But this is a novel for adults, very much a coming-of-age novel. There'd be no problem with kids reading it, too. Looking at four girls growing up in Brooklyn in the 1970s. And... Listeners may remember that last year I recommended Dylan Thomas's Child's Christmas in Wales. And despite the very different subject matters, this book reminds me of that one a lot. Partly Dylan Thomas, of course, also a poet, writing a nostalgic book as as this one is. And in the the compression and the tone, the nostalgia, and and the precision of language, I mean, it's just a really— You can tell it's a poet at work. Yeah, you can tell it's a poet at work. It's a a really beautiful book, very sad in the kind of drifting apart, the, the loss at the core of this friendship— And, of of course, it's very much about the narrator's own family and coming to terms with her own personal losses as as well. So it's uh, another Brooklyn by Jacqueline Woodson. I'm really enjoying it. Yeah, I found it very evocative of time and place and of a particular, you know, sort of slice of New York City that maybe isn't as well represented in other Brooklyn novels. Yeah, and there's there's a nice little ambivalence in the title, Another Brooklyn, because it is giving you a slice of a Brooklyn that a lot of readers don't have access to and, and, and won't know. But it's also the character's dream of another Brooklyn besides mm-hmm. the one that they have. Right. And, and it's a Brooklyn that no longer really exists, at least in that way. Yeah. Uh, from that yeah, that's right. Period. Jen, what are you reading? So I picked up a book. This is a book called Cold New World, Growing Up in Harder Country by William Finnegan. And I picked this up because actually it was something that I saw recommended on social media. William Finnegan, the the New Yorker writer who wrote the surfing memoir, Barbarian Days. Exactly. And I actually had no idea he had written this book. This was published in 1998. And he was already a New Yorker writer at the time. Is this on Instagram or Twitter? No, this was on... Okay, I'll be more specific. This is on... This is on Twitter. (laughs) I don't even know what Snapchat is. This is on Twitter. And a couple of writers whom I know were discussing it, as people do sometimes on Twitter, saying what an amazing book it is. And, you know, it's just sort of exemplary of a certain kind of narrative nonfiction writing. I'm just only about probably a quarter of the way through. What he did was he spent, I think, about six years living among teenagers in four different parts of the country. And this is during the 90s. So this was during the time when the national economy was ostensibly booming, but life was actually getting harder for a lot of people because a lot of that boom came in the growth in low-wage jobs and also because there was a lot of growth at the top of the economic scale. So he's meeting kids who are really living in poverty or right on the poverty line. You know, Finnegan himself is, he's in it, he's in the narrative. And also what he does is he, as much as he can, he does have interviews with them and he did, you know, try to really sort of understand where they're coming from. But at the same time, he wanted to give them a chance to show him what they thought were the most important stories in their lives. And also he did a lot of just observing and just sort of spending time Six with them. Six years. I mean, it sounds like Six Captain years. Boo with um, Behind yeah. Beautiful Forever or some, something like that, kind yes. of immersive narrative yes, nonfiction. for sure. What are the other communities where he 
So he himself. He goes to eastern Texas later on, and then Washington State, and then north Los Angeles, sort of all around the country. And Not in, just cities then, eastern mm, Texas, you're talking like real, really rural. Rural, yeah. rural. And there he says, you know, I, I haven't gotten to that part yet, but there he says that, he, you know, he wanted to find a community, even though it's in Texas, it's really the rural deep south. And then in Washington State, he goes to a place where a lot of the sort of farm and agricultural labor is dependent on Mexican immigrants. And so that's another section of the book. And then Northern LA is actually a place I think he spent a lot of time in growing up, um, but he hadn't really spent much time there since. So he goes back to see what's happening there in the 90s. You're reading this, it takes place in the 1990s. Obviously, Mm -hmm. many of these issues have not gone away. Right. Does it feel like you could be reading about contemporary America? I mean, it does sort of feel like this is laying the ground for what we've got right now. I mean, just in terms of sort of the harshness of what these kids are going through, the real diminished expectations, the sort of sense that you know, people now feel more locked in, I guess, to the class that they were born into. That's some of what he gets at. And according at least to the introduction, that's something that he finds not just in New Haven, but all across the country. I'm personally still adjusting to the fact that the 1990s can be considered a historical period at this point. No, I know. I know. (laughs) Take us away from that, John. What are you reading? I'm reading... A book by someone who's also immersed in his in his culture. He's a scientist. The book is called The Evolution of Beauty by Richard O. Prum. And Prum is an ornithologist at Yale University. And I just realized looking at his bio in the back, he's got this great line that says, he helped discover dinosaur feathers and their colors. That's a oh, pretty cool uh, yeah. you know, resume builder. Yeah. <laughs> um, but this book is is it's brilliant. You know, it's hard to put it down in the subway when I get to work in the morning. That's how exciting it is. That's to how work exciting at the New York it is. Times. <laughs> just want to keep reading all about... these exciting little birds on the cover. Um, <laughs> It's about Darwinism, and it's essentially, and it's very much an argument that we've kind of lost half of Darwin's legacy and and ignored it at our scientific peril. But I read a book maybe 15, 20 years ago by Daniel Dennett called Darwin's Dangerous Idea, which is a great overview of evolution and sort of a a passionate defense of Darwinism in the face of, you know, um, religious objections or other cultural things. By the end of that book, it It goes so crazily in the full direction of saying that Darwinism can explain, like, the operas that we prefer. You know, it just – it really adapts the the meme argument of a Richard Dawkins or someone that culture and everything else can be explained by Darwinism. Prum is very obviously pro-science, but he's taking an opposite tack, which is that he's saying that people are so wedded to the idea of Darwinism that they don't remember that Darwin said that – There are ways in which, especially sexually, that animals choose each other for reasons that are purely aesthetic, that they don't have to do with the passing on of good genes or fitness, and that this over time results in all of these crazy sort of ornamentations of feathers and colors that really don't have any purpose. They're just things that look good. And And high divorce rates among human beings. (laughs) (laughs) No, exactly. And I think, I feel like a lot of what he's doing is the science equivalent of like the, you know, economics theory saying that we're not real all rational actors, that it's crazy to act as though we all always make the decision that will benefit us most. And he's saying that, you know, these animals, it, it's kind of a, a great idea that they have essentially free will, that they they don't care if you have the perfect genes because they like the way your feathers look. But he's a great breezy writer. And so he's he's giving you really profound information, but in a very conversational way. And it's I think it's one of the best popular science books I've ever read. For, forgive my scientific ignorance here, but isn't there an argument that the ornamentation, the feathers are are themselves signaling your genetic perfection. Well, what he's <laughs> saying is, is that the, the strict Darwinists now, yes, they argue that there has to be a specific reason that any ornamentation that is preferred over time does signal essentially a good gene. Yeah, or, some, something and, suitable. And, and Prem is just saying, you know, it's a podcast, so I don't have time. But I would <laughs> highly urge people to read the book because he's basically saying that, it, it, that that's not true. And he's very convincing, at least to me. So, Pamela? All right. Very briefly, because I, as I said earlier, and I'll cop to why, due to the combination of some work-related reading about which I cannot speak, combined Ooh. with various work endeavors pretty much every night for the last two weeks, 
and the additional distraction of Stranger Things season two. <laughs> um, <laughs> I have not read very much, and I'm still, embarrassingly enough, on a novella, which I, I feel like you – and I don't want this to reflect badly on the book, which is Haji Marat by Leo Tolstoy. I spoke about it last week because it really is actually a page turner, and I, I do long to turn the pages, but I have only had the time to turn a few. <laughs> um, uh, it's 115 pages, and I'm on a page 102, and there's a lot oh. left to be resolved. <laughs> yeah. So um, I did think I would have it done by the this week. You can all really make fun of me if I have not gotten to the end next week. And I'll, I'll leave it there. That's um, on tape, so we'll remember yeah. Can we make fun right. of you anyway? Yes. <laughs> Always. All right. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Pamela. Thanks, Pamela. Thanks, Pamela. Remember, there's more at nytimes.com slash books, and you can always write to us at books at nytimes.com. Inside the New York Times Book Review is produced by Pedro Rosado from Headstepper Media. Thanks for listening. For the New York Times, I'm Pamela Paul. Thank you.